Thank you very much, Lorato. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the Hausa for inviting me and, uh, and allowing me to be part of the conference. I would like to meet the person who put me right at the end, the graveyard shift. The only good side is I see a couple of people have left, so less pressure. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to engage with you. I found the discussions very interesting today, but I also think that it's a fantastic opportunity for us to share what we're doing in the public sector and for us to start maybe contributing to your discourse. So I've been asked to share with you what we've been doing at the Freer Hospital for the last five years that I've been there and how we've been leading during these times of challenge and change. Essentially, it's a story about improving our governance and the leadership within our facility and we're fortunate in that we've been able to have measurable impact on the lives, patient outcomes, as well as patient experience of care. And given that there are some economists in the room, I'm going to be very careful with saying cost efficiencies that we've also gained in the facility. So for those of you who don't know Freer Hospital, it's a 900-bedded academic facility located in East London. We provide specialist services to about 2.8 million people that live in the central region of our province. We have an operational budget of just under 1.2 billion rand, and we have just over 2,200 employees who work there. On any given day, we have between 1,000 and 1,200 outpatients, and we admit up to 45,000 patients per year. I'm going to take you very quickly through what the problem was when I started five years ago, to the turnaround that we implemented, the results that we've achieved, and so maybe share with you some of the lessons we feel uh, may be of interest to you. So starting with the problem, I'm not going to go and unpack the global trends in healthcare that we faced at the time, because I think previous speakers have been quite articulate in expressing the changing burden and increasing burden of disease on the one hand, consumers demanding better quality of care, but on the other hand, we have systems that are grappling with increasing costs and, and fractured systems. We also know that the world has committed to a universal access and sustainable development goals, and we have committed as a country for that as well, towards that. Coming closer to home, when I started at Freer Hospital, we were in the newspaper. These are some articles that uh, was the national newspaper, Babies Dying in 2008. In 2012, there were articles in my first six months about the poor quality of care. Generally, the state, the hospital was in a state of disrepair, maintenance hadn't been done, broken equipment, litter, etc., all over the hospital. And my first day on the job, I teased the staff now, I was sitting in my office, and there was chanting and singing, you know, and I like to tease them and say, what a warm welcome for my first full day on the job. But of course, it was a toy toy. <laughs> we owed our staff salaries and benefits, and we can laugh about it now, but at the time, it was a very painful experience. So we had lots of labor instability around the fact that we owed them salaries and, and their benefits. The public confidence in the service and the quality of care that we provided was also at an all-time low. And we had the Public Protector, the Human Rights Commission, all visiting the facility, investigating complaints about the quality of care we provided. So clearly, we needed to turn the situation around. And we accepted right up front that the only way to turn it around was not only to improve the operations performance and how we were managing the facility, but we also needed to look at how to engage and rejuvenate leadership within our institution. And the main focus of what I want to talk about is on this element of leadership. In simplistic terms, for me, leadership is all about vision and it's about people. And so we went right back to understanding what our mandate is. For us, it was obvious we're an academic teaching facility, so it was about providing tertiary services, about teaching, training, and research. But the third mandate we have, which is perhaps not as emphasized in the private sector as it is with us, is that by what we do and how we do it, we contribute towards the developmental agenda of our country. So how do we reduce poverty, inequality, etc.? We then made sure that our vision statement and our mission statement was aligned with this mandate. And then it was a very simple turnaround strategy. We concentrated on two things. The first element was the provision of patient-centered care. So realigning everything that we did around patient-centered care. And the second element was making sure that the delivery of that care was as efficient as possible. 
So we define patient-centred care as safe, effective and reliable care of a standard that the patients were satisfied with and that began addressing the burden of disease and demand for care. With respect to efficiency of care, given <laughs> that I met people on strike on the first day, it was very important that our employees realised that they were our most valued asset. It was also important that people work together as a team and that teams collaborated. And of course, we needed to have key structures and systems in place. I was a, a, new, a newly appointed CEO, so any changes I introduced needed to be mission critical, but also visible to secure buy-in of the community and the team that I was leading. And leadership was the institutional glue that held our strategy together. So leadership at Freya Hospital is across three levels. It's how you lead yourself, how you lead the team, and how you lead throughout the organization. So I just want to share three basic things around leading self. The issue of congruence, the issue of behaviors, and the issues of, of being appropriate for, for situations we confront. So there's been many, many studies around top performing executives. The Hay Group International has done a study uh, examining emotional and social intelligence of top performing executives, over 53,000. And I was very fortunate to also be part of a study to have my EI and social intelligence measured. And emotional and social intelligence, it's essentially about knowing and understanding how I feel, being able to manage and control my emotions, and social intelligence is about how I understand the other person and how I manage my relationship. And all top performing executives have this congruence between not only having the technical capability to do their job, but they also have high social and emotional intelligence. The third element is also important, is having the right values. So I am a civil servant because I believe in social justice. Being in the public sector is a deliberate choice of mine because I believe that that is the way in which I can give expression and effect to social justice. So it's very important to be in an organization that matches your personal values. The second point is that behaviors can be learned and developed as can your emotional and social intelligence. And there are many, many tools to measure your own leadership behaviors and your leadership personality types. And again, I've had the opportunity to do this on a regular basis and you can actually see whether or not you're improving over time. The third element is that different situations require you to behave differently and to make different choices. You can if implement and effect discipline, but you can also do so in an empathetic way. And if there's time at the end, I can give specific examples. With respect to leading the team at Freya Hospital, we started out with just what I call the forming stage. And this was a stage where I changed the structure of the leadership team. So you are on the top management team, not based on your rank, but based on your function. And so it doesn't matter to me that the quality assurance manager is a level eight. She's an equal partner of the team with our directors of, let's say, facilities, because she contributes towards patient-centered care. The second element was agreeing on what was acceptable behavior within our team. And at the end of each management meeting, we would not only reflect on whether we were achieving our operational goals, but we would also ask ourselves, are we behaving in terms of what we agreed on? And we would then reflect and look at how we could improve. We are very blessed to be a team that is, has stabilized and I've got a highly performance driven team that I work with. The important thing about our leadership team is that we have to be visible, not just during good times, but also during crises, as well as in our quality improvement projects. And I can give you many stories of leadership actually rolling up the sleeves and getting involved in working with the staff. Leading within the organization. This is when I was Chief Director for Human Resource Development. We had a strategy, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it. It suffice to say that many organizations concentrate on attracting and maybe training their employees. But very few organizations think about how do we engage the people, our subordinates, and how do we inspire them so that they not only perform, but that they also want to continuously improve that which they're doing. And that's what we did at Freer Hospital. We concentrated on the engagement and the inspiring. So how did we do this? 
Again, I'm not going to take you through the model, but we took that pipeline and we then developed organization supporting processes. And I'm going to illustrate what we did. The starting point for me was to understand what was causing dissatisfaction. Why were people going out on a toy toy? What were the things they believed, the staff on the ground, that could make the situation better? So I spent the first six months literally in the tea rooms of the staff, the cleaners, etc., to know and understand what they were facing. And that allowed us to develop strategies that would enable our employees to perform better. The hard issues was obviously to pay what we owed them. So within one year, we paid over 90% of all people owed salaries and benefits. We gave them the tools to do their, their job. We gave them protective clothing because that was an issue for our staff. But we also looked at the soft issues. We looked at opportunities that created and built common ground, that promoted teamwork, that recognized what people were doing, and we implemented a wellness program. Our recruitment plan was also aligned because the existing staff were burnt out and we needed to employ critical staff. And if you were to examine the staff, you can see if we talk about, for example, improving patient-centered care, we needed more nurses. If we wanted a clean environment, we needed cleaners. And this was a shift from the recruitment patterns before, where a lot of recruitment focused on administration posts. So we changed our recruitment pattern. And then we also looked at how to motivate our staff. And there are three essential things around motivation. Every person likes to win. We all South Africans, um, I think we're very excited when the Springboks won on Saturday. And when they lose, everybody knows why we lost. You know, we're all experts. Yeah, you see. <laughs> um, and so at our hospital, we looked at programs of recognition. And I'll give you some examples. Giving people the power to perform and do their job is very important. And building the sense of family, the affiliation to the organization is what we focused on. We used a number of platforms, so we've got a very good reputation now with the media. We've worked very hard to have a good rapport with the media. And we use that platform. These are all stories of how we celebrate both individual and also team successes at the facility. We also look at formal recognition programs. So every single year since 2014, we've had a regional businesswoman association winner and finalist. We've also had a national winner. We've had local heroes, we've had Sama recognized Spirit Awards, and this year, this past month, we won the National Case Manager of the Year as well. So we use these existing programs to nominate our, our staff and to recognize them. With respect to sharing autonomy, I hate micromanaging. <laughs> and so I believe we've, we've started a process the last two and a half years where the nursing managers, the medical doctors, heads of department, give input to how we allocate resources and what we will prioritize. I also, once we've allocated cost center managers, I don't interfere with not only the resource allocation, but once it's allocated to them, they've got to manage the funds appropriately. And they found this to be very empowering. With respect to the Freer family, we have a number of formal structures. So we've got an institutional, it's called an ITF, Transformation Forum, where we constructively every month engage with labor around issues that are pertinent and relevant to them. We've got a formal newsletter where we share what is happening in the institution. But we also have informal occasions where we just share life and laughter with our staff. We encourage our staff to participate in social responsibility programs, and we've got numerous examples. This is the third year we've participated in the Cell C Take a Girl Child to, to Work, for example. We've encouraged our staff to go out into the community, at the halls, and they do health awareness. So there are lots of social responsibility programs. And um, that was just the example I've told you about now. Oh, and let me share this with you. Of the 42 girls who came on the program to the hospital, 31 had been born at Freya. And I always joke and say, you can sneeze at Freer Hospital and someone in the community will know. There's a very big interest by the community on what happens at the hospital because they've either born there, they work there, their neighbor works there, etc. I, I call it a community hospital. And the other element of building the, the Freer affiliation, the sense of family, is to appreciate the staff. Every year we have a braai. Um, one night last year, I took a chocolate around a night stop. It took me four nights to go around and say, thank you very much. You know, it's been a tough year, but thank you for what you do. Only one nurse said to me, is that all we're getting this year? <laughs> 
And I said, oh, you know, I'm really sorry. We don't have money. But if you don't want it, I'll take it back from you. Of course, she opened the wrap and shoved it in her mouth <laughs> before I could take it. But it's very important to catch your staff not only not doing what they should be doing, but catch them doing the right thing and say thank you. So what are the desired outcomes? Well, the most important outcome for me is that every individual links what it is that they do to what you're trying to achieve within the organization. And again, if time allows, I'll be able to give you an example. This is our wheelchair mechanic, and he's come up with a system. He, he has a motor plan for every wheelchair. So when you get your wheelchair, you get a maintenance plan with your dates. So when you come back, he teaches you how to look after it. And then he discovered that people were not collecting his wheelchairs. So Mr. Tapalisi came to ask me, can he please do outreach to communities close by to deliver the wheelchairs to the patients? He's now started an outreach to Aliwell North, which is about 200 k's from us, to go and teach and help communities out there. It saves money, and people appreciate the service. It's as important that not only do individuals connect what they do on a daily basis to what you're trying to achieve with patient-centered care, but they know that they've also got to collaborate. And so we've got numerous examples where people recognize that they work as part of a team, that they work across teams, so the whole multidisciplinary approach. And clinical staff recognize that the doctor and nurse can only do what they do because they contribute to the doctor and nurse being able to give the service. The other advantage that, that comes up and this is not something that I consciously planned, but there's so many different value adds to this approach. And what we found is, I just to cite one example, one of the staff members came to me and she said, you know, she's been wanting to run this creative arts therapy program for oncology and long-stay patients. Um, we didn't have money for it, but she then approached the community and asked for donations of wool. We got the donations of wool and she started teaching not just the women, but also the men how to crochet, how to knit, how to stitch. Of course, we eventually used up all the wool. And she then came forward and asked, can we have a market to be able to sell the goods and we will use that money to buy more wool? And so the program sustains itself. And these are the value adds that you never thought about when you employ someone. So I, I really appreciate the staff. There are many examples of how they constantly think about how to improve the experience of care at the facility. So that was about leading self, leading team, leading the organization. At the same time, we were implementing across the entire hospital systematic changes to what we were doing. We started out by asking ourselves, what is the value proposition when you come to Freya? Well, clearly, you want to have the best possible outcomes. You want to have a positive experience of care. And I always tell the staff, don't think that the patient who comes to the public hospital is not paying for it. They are, because they pay taxes and those taxes fund our hospital. So they're contributing to the upkeep of the facility. And so value for money is as important in the public sector as it is in the private sector. And the advantage we have over the private sector is that our, our staff already participate in multidisciplinary teams because we're under the same roof, and that has huge benefits to our patients. We took that value proposition and we unpacked it. We defined what each of those value propositions meant to us, and then we implemented quality improvement projects. So for example, there was a complaint that the pharmacy waiting time was four to six hours, and in some cases, we sent patients home. We then set up a QIP, which looked at how to manage the demand, how to improve our capability to meet the demand, and how to make our processes lean. The end result is that it now takes less than 45 minutes for you to get your medication at the facility. <laughs> Thank you, and it took us two years to achieve that, but we built it up slowly over time. And that's the approach we use throughout our facility. We also have a very different way of how we plan and allocate. So given that it's a very resource-constrained environment, we're driven by patient-centered care. So our first starting point is to say, what are the outcomes we want to achieve? So if we want to reduce pharmacy waiting times, what resources do we need to allocate to achieve that and guarantee a return on that investment? Other projects that we have look at how to eliminate waste and inefficiencies, and also we've got projects that focus on innovation. But the bedrock, the foundation of our planning and budget allocation is that we must have engaged and inspired employees. 
while the doctors were introduced that every department had to do clinical audits. And the aim was to identify avoidable causes of death so that they could improve their practice. But as management, we also looked at how to improve our capability to assist the doctors. So we invested heavily in medical equipment, in ICT plants and buildings, to improve our ability to make a diagnosis, to improve, say, patient treatment and to make it safer, and also our ability to monitor the response of patients to treatment. Oh, sorry. So these are just some of the examples. Every year we've been commissioning new facilities at the hospital from the time that I got there. And this is what we're working on at the moment for the next three years. We not only built and upgraded, but we also introduced a plan preventative maintenance. So when you're investing in capital, you've got to make sure that you protect that investment. And these are just photographs of what the facility looked like before. This is the new section and this is the old section. We did carpentry, painting, plumbing, etc. And obviously it also contributed to our strategy of having a clean and safe workplace for our staff. The other element uh, which is very important to us, I am blessed to have a brilliant ICT team. Two of our managers are also software developers. And so five years ago when I got there, because my, my main interest is health information systems, every job I come into I always had to develop a performance monitoring system. And this allowed us to start tracking our performance. We have developed on a modular basis an electronic patient record system. It's one of 42 systems that the country has been assessing as a potential system for us to use going forward. We've now made it through to the second round of 19 systems left. The only module that we're busy developing now is the billing module. But it uses open source. We've already saved 10 and a half million rand by doing our own development, no license fees, etc. And we're now rolling out to other provinces. Well, sorry, we're rolling out within our province to other facilities. And KwaZulu Natal have indicated that they would like to roll it out in their province. So it's a very exciting innovation that we're very proud of. So those are the inputs and some of the process issues, but are we getting the desired results? We are measurably saving more lives than we did before, and less harm is being done. So this is the crude death rate. When I started, it was sitting at 5.8 deaths per 100. The lowest we've managed to achieve was four deaths per 100. This is an indication of changes now in, in the, the burden of disease. We can actually see that we analyze every quarter, look at the details, we look at why people are dying, what they're dying of, and I can definitely see the shift. We've had a significant reduction when we introduced ARVs and maternal deaths, and we've managed to reduce the number of deaths coming through by collaborating with the districts. But we've also focused on avoidable causes of death in children. And you can see in 2008 when that terrible report came out, that was our child mortality rate, and it's now under three deaths per 100. With in respect to our hospital acquired infection rates, again in 2008 we were blasted at a national level, but we've had an 84% reduction in hospital acquired infection rates. Our ICUs, through a number of different interventions, we've managed to reduce the infection rates by 63 and 64% for the PEDS and the adults ICU. And the same with our burn service, a 95% reduction in sepsis rates. Our pressure ulcers within the institution We've had a challenge in the last two years that they've centralized power and recruitment, and so we've had a net loss of nurses. And it becomes very difficult to sustain the 54% reduction we had in, in patient falls. But because we've improved the systems of how we're managing the facility, we've still managed to keep it within 26% less than what it was five years ago. And the same is true with patient falls. Patient experience of care. The number of complaints, thank goodness, have decreased and the number of compliments have increased significantly. 90% um, of all comments now that we receive as an institution are compliments. Our annual patient satisfaction survey scores have been above 85% and this year we've actually, we've now gone into more detail. Some of the questions you were asking, Gaines, about um, what was my experience of care? Those are the types of questions we've now included in our survey. And we've got an 85% score on inpatients and a 75% score on OPD services. 
We also, through our IT team, we've developed our own social media platforms. So if you're on Facebook, Freya Hospital East London, go and look it up and like our page and you can follow and see what's happening at the facility. There was a lot of skepticism when we introduced it in November, sorry, October of 2015. There was concern about what if people can see what you're doing, what if they can see what they're complaining about, etc. But we bit the bullet and we've done it and it's, been, it's become a fantastic platform for us to communicate with stakeholders to say this is what's happening at the facility but also for them to engage with us as management. And so it's a platform that, that we really enjoy. We also have a website. With respect to efficiency of care, the demand has definitely gone up. Some of that uh, we've seen are, are shifts from patients who run out of medical aids and now come over to our facility. We've had a 16% increase in PDE compared to the preceding 10 years. We've managed to reduce our bed utilization rates to under 80%. We've been grappling in the last year and keeping it down for a number of reasons, but it's still under 80%. And our average length of stay, which is sitting at 6.6, .6, we've managed to bring down to around 5.6. The national target is 5.5 days for a tertiary facility. At Freya Hospital, it's not an achievement to employ someone. And it's not an achievement to buy an MRI. For us, it's an achievement when that investment increases throughput. So what this graph shows is when we didn't have our own MRI, the orange graphs are the numbers of patients we sent to the private sector to have an MRI done and a report taken. And you could see we couldn't afford it. It cost us about 10,000 Rand per patient to be done in the private sector. But once we invested in our own MRI, this started out in May, so a few went up to May, and then after May, we started seeing the blue graph. These are patients that can now have an MRI within our institution. And you can see that the unit cost dropped significantly by 8,000 Rand per patient. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen an improvement in the quality of care at Freya Hospital. We're not perfect. We've got a program of revitalizing the infrastructure, and there are more programs still to come. We're very blessed to have engaged employees to the point where they're so dedicated that I worry about them because we're absorbing the challenges of, of inadequate budget allocations purely by virtue of the people that keep the, the system going. The public confidence to a large extent has been restored. And so I thought maybe to just share some of the leadership lessons. Again, the starting point is that your mandate, you've got to know what it is, why you exist, and your mission and vision must be aligned to that. For us, leading activation was all about leading across the three levels of managing and knowing and understanding yourself, about leading your team, and then leading within the organization. And self is about that congruence between your values, your emotional and social intelligence with your technical capability. Teams got to be visible, visible, and they've got to lead by example, and you've got to have engaged and inspired employees. So the points to ponder is our turnaround is driven by people. Secondly, we changed how we think about ourselves. We are social entrepreneurs as managers at the hospital. We're not there to grow the profit for our shareholders. We want to grow and develop the well-being of the communities that we serve, social capital. And so because we have a very challenging environment, we also have to be entrepreneurial in our thinking on how we deliver the services. Entrepreneurship is not confined to the private sector only. We're incredibly proud civil servants. We've also changed how we think about our business. So if we're in the business of saving lives, we've got to measure if we're doing that. If we're in the business of saying we want to have a positive experience of care, we have to measure that and see whether in fact we are achieving it. And if not, we need to be able to introduce interventions and monitor whether we're on track. But I'm very blessed to work with colleagues, both in the management team, but also our staff. We are bound by these shared values all of us believe from our union workers and union leaders to our staff, we believe that we come to work every day to make a difference to the people who need it most. And so we lead from the inside out. I'm going to show you a video that was produced at Freya Hospital. It is used by Chuck as a tool to, to um, raise funds. But I just want you to listen to the words and also observe the interaction between the patient, the, the family, the mother and father, and our staff. You 
children they don't ask to have the disease they have but they say they young and they strong and they'll rise and what's to say that us as adults public and private sector can't work together so that we can also provide care to the people who need it most thank you very much Congratulations and thank you for sharing your story, Rolina. I almost feel like what's left to say? There's nothing we really should be saying other than to give you another standing ovation and just ask you, you know, to come and share your insights more personally. However, my takeaway from what you've said is you put people first, you consider the community, you have empathy, and then you inspire people to do things. Did I understand it correctly? Absolutely. That's basically your formula. Absolutely. However, here's the caveat. Well. In order to institute some of those changes, maintenance, you need some cash. How much did it cost you, even in these constrained circumstances, mm -hmm. to make these changes? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So government, I was very fortunate. When I was director of hospitals way back, when I met Paul Mappen, that you'll meet tomorrow, that was in 2002, 2003, to give away my age we started the process of commissioning these new projects and they tend to take long but i had the advantage when i became ceo of the hospital that these projects were now at the final commissioning stage and so government through program eight had already allocated money towards the first phase of development the second phases was for me to leverage off other programs 
And so we were very blessed to have money prioritized and channeled towards us. As some projects came off, we had other projects come in. However, just an inside tip, because I see there are some public sector managers in the room, they, we have a challenge with spending capital budgets within the public sector. And so I always, my team and I have a, a <laughs> a little, uh, what I call the shelf projects. They're quick things that when you want to spend money, you can divert the money to us to be able to get some of those projects off the ground. The other element is we believe very strongly in forming strategic partnerships. So, for example, we managed to get 20 million rand from carte blanche to build two dedicated pediatric theatres. We also managed to get two million rand because what I do is when business people come to the hospital, I do all the PR and marketing, I show them the vision, I show them what we're doing and take them around the facility and they see how engaged and excited the staff are. And so one woman at the end of that gave us two million rand from her own money to build a classroom for the pediatrics, to do some basic renovation and upgrades in the pediatric ward and to build a staff facility, a staff tea room. And so we're always looking for opportunities to supplement our income. Also within our team, if you implement a cost savings project, so our PAC system, we were spending 110,000 Rand per month to print x-rays. We've now digitized completely. So the private sector, I must say, they're not fully digitized in East London, but we are. And um, that has saved us money. So when you have a cost saving project that saves, at this point it's 1.2 million per year, your incentive and in my management team is that you can use some of that money for development projects, which includes some infrastructure projects. So we divert money to them. Those are some of the mechanisms right. we use. The story of the lady with the chocolate struck me because I'm a bit of a chocoholic. <laughs> so I would have been her. I would have taken the chocolate and I would have still asked the cheeky question. <laughs> However, mm. There's only so many chocolate incentives you can give people. Yep. At some point, they do need the staff a financial incentive, and you're constrained. So how else do you retain staff? Okay. So most people, I believe, that people come to work and they must have a sense of purpose. And that's why I spoke about aligning your values, what it is that makes you feel motivated. And just this past weekend, our OTs got together and they did a fundraiser for rehab and they also raised awareness about what occupational therapy can do for you as a patient. So they're always coming up with ideas. They don't just come to work to see 45 patients in OPD for the day. They come there because they know they also get an opportunity to do something that makes them feel warm inside. We are the only facility that don't actually have annual awards to individuals. I'm not that comfortable giving awards to individuals. I much prefer recognizing teams. And just appearing in the newspaper, it's incredible. When Mr. Fakari, we started a, a program, engineering program, and we allocated funds to develop artisans. And we promised that if they qualify, we would absorb them into artisan posts. 16 people went through the program. The first gentleman that went through failed. And we couldn't fund him again because we paid for his trade test. To cut a long story short, he raised the funds himself for his retest, and he passed. He came to my office, and he was so excited when he got his artisan award. Uh, his certificate. And I said, you know, this is wonderful. Please come at the next board meeting. I want to share this with the board. And then I told the Daily Dispatch about it, and they were excited. And so they did this little feature for him in the newspaper. I bought him a chocolate, and I bought him a newspaper, and I put it in a little bag to go and give him this newspaper when it came out in the media. But he was so excited. He bought him and one of the other people who was in the newspaper. They told all their family across the country. They bought 10 copies of the newspaper. So there are many different non-financial ways in which you can make people feel good about who they are and what they do. And their jobs right. become expressions of themselves. Uh, over the last two days, we've spoken about PPPs and um, collaboration and how there can be collaboration between public and private. You found a formula where you can utilize the internal talent. But do you have an example where you've had to go somewhere along the supply chain to private sector uh, service providers and, e and be able to provide a service more efficiently? And are there lessons that can be garnered from that? Yeah, thank you. So just, well, there are two examples I want to give you. The, the one example was the private sector was upgrading their bunkers. And so they needed their private patients to be treated. And we actually had a, formed a partnership where the private patients came through our facility and we provided care to them for the five months. So it's possible to do it the other way around. 
Um, but for a specific example, with cardiology, we don't have any full-time cardiologists, but the two out of the three cardiologists in town do sessions with us. We had allocated money for a cath lab, but that was reprioritized within the province to, to the east, to Mtata. So we now could not do our cath lab, and we had two cardiologists in session. So two and a half years ago, we approached the private sector. They have a cath lab, which is underutilized in town. And we started with just selecting valve replacements. We identified how much money we could prioritize for, for valve replacements, and we, we tested the system. And actually, once we saw it was working, we're now expanding it to other interventions because, what's today, the second yesterday, our cardiothoracic surgeon joined our team. And so we wanted to do more intervention. So I think the formula for us, given that it's resource constrained, is that we spread what we do across multiple years. It cost us 10 and a half million rand to replace all our beds and mattresses. We didn't have 10 and a half million rand, but we split it over three years. And in fact, in the third year, money was again taken out because of the impact of medical legals to elsewhere in the province, but we then split it over four years. So it took time. Same with our cardiology. We built our cardiology services over time. Uh, it was a 68 million rand investment in infrastructure, but every year we produced a new oncologist that we absorbed. Right. And so that's how we've built the system. And finally, obviously, I mean, this is a bit of a you know, putting you on the spot. The question is basically, you know, why is she not being used to train other CEOs within the government hospital environment? So I think let me change it a little bit and say, were you to meet some of your peers, it's not a one-size-fits-all formula, but what would you say? Okay. So thank you for the question and the comment. I, uh, I, part of my personal growth in the public sector was a chief director of human resource development. And at the time, we used to have annual conferences like this. I was saying to Will at the back that I find it disturbing. It's the second time I'm presenting at your conference, but I don't see a strong public sector presence. And one of the visions we should have as a country is to say, how do we have a hospital association of South Africa that combines public and private sector? I would welcome the opportunity to start a process and a program of bringing us together to share ideas and experiences. I don't think that we learn as fast as we could because we're not collaborating and we don't have formal structures that allow us to do so, and neither do we have informal platforms to do that either. And perhaps that's something we should be looking at. Dr. Rowleen Wagner, ladies and gentlemen. Mad, I, I asked, thank you, I asked Lerati if I'm, I could be allowed to just make some closing remarks. And I think my closing remark is that we are all in this lifeboat together, both public and private sector. And just very quickly, do, do any of you in the room know what the Kiki Challenge is? Show of hands, those of you who know the Kiki Challenge? Okay, very few of you. So, um, the Kiki Challenge is a guy called Drake is a rap artist and he's come up with a song, Kiki, Do You Love Me? And young people jump out of moving cars. I'll show you an example very quickly where they dance to the song and try not to make fools of themselves. So this is a young woman because I wanted the girl to look very cool. Okay, so she jumps out, she does these cool moves and Drake goes, Kiki, do you love me? Okay, we get it. Can't play hip hop softly, gentlemen. All right, so it looks easy, doesn't it? Uh, here's an example of a guy in the hey. United States. Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Say me, I want you. I know, it looked easy, didn't it? Now, there are these guys in India, they, they work the plow, and they've decided they also want to do the Kiki challenge. Okay, so the point is that they're actually doing the Kiki Challenge. And ladies and gentlemen, it's immutable. The world has decided for us to sustain our development, we need to ensure that there's universal access, and the NHI is a mechanism to achieve that. 
Um, we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost, which is why we wanted to phase it in as government. But as several other speakers have said, we need case studies and we need models to test what can work and what is not going to work. And so I want to share the sentiments expressed by previous speakers. The time has come. I love the idea of convergence. I think you're absolutely correct. I can tell you that as the public sector, there are many of us who are willing to collaborate because we serve the same people. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.